Hello, everybody. This is Brad Johnson with Hamilton County Public Health. I also have Kyle Dexter here. Uh, Kyle and I are in the uh, stormwater division here at Hamilton County Public Health, and we're going to be doing a presentation on stormwater pollution and what uh, you can do as a community and what you can do as an individual to not only identify pollution but to basically prevent pollution and sustain and basically make improvements for your community. Um, a couple of housekeeping things to take note of here. If you have any questions at all during the presentation, the easiest way to um, contact us is on the chat box on the left-hand side of the screen, and uh, we will answer you back uh, depending on the question either during the presentation or at the end. And for those of you who are watching this uh, after it's been recorded, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and uh, verbalize the question so everybody can hear it and provide the, the answer um, to that question as well. So we'll go ahead and get started. What we're going to do today is kind of go over, it's, we're going to start pretty basic. Um, we realize that this, uh, the audience might not be familiar with stormwater pollution, so we're going to kind of start from the very beginning and give you uh, the nuts and bolts of basically how the pollution gets there, what causes it, um, you know, really what does this mean for your community, what does it mean for you, what does it mean for your family. Uh, we'll talk about how government has looked at it as a problem and how they regulate that and what that means for you. We'll also um, look at what you can do. That's probably what most people are going to be looking at with this presentation. What can we be doing to, to better ourselves and our community to prevent these things? And you'll probably find out it's, it's actually rather easy. A lot of this is just uh, people aren't aware of the problem. So hopefully when you walk away from this, you'll have a better understanding of what you can do. And finally, um, Kyle will be doing the second half of this presentation, and Kyle will focus on some success stories um, that we've had here within the last, uh, mostly within the last year, but within the last two years. So you can see real events here in Hamilton County that we've encountered, and it's actually been because of presentations like this where we've educated the public and businesses on stormwater pollution and they've contacted us and we've uh, gone out and investigated and basically taken care of the problem. So really, I guess the first thing is uh, we all want clean water. I don't think anybody's going to argue with the fact that uh, clean water is uh, good for obviously for our drinking and uh, our families, but also for uh, where we live, work, and play. So uh, basically this affects everybody. And something a lot of people don't think about, but this goes back to grade school and some of the things we learned about the water cycle, is in a natural environment, we actually have a pretty nice built-in filter for our water sources. So without human uh, intervention, you can see you pretty much just have your natural water cycle where you have a lot, lot of uh, natural filters where water will percolate through the soil. You have natural bacteria. Um, you know, sediment is basically held up by vegetation. So we actually have a lot of clean water in our environments when you go to areas that aren't inhabited by, by people. For example, when people go up to Alaska, they're always astounded by the water quality and how clear the water is and how beautiful. But we don't live in that world here in most of uh, our communities, we live in a world that looks more like this slide here, where um, you have a lot of things that uh, get into our water cycle that people don't account for. Um, you know, the thing that most people think about when they think of water pollution, and one of the reasons the EPA was even formed, is these big factories. You know, factories are polluters, they have these pipes that discharge waste into our waters and pollute it. Well, there is some truth to that, but to be honest with you, over 80% of the pollution we have in our waters today has nothing to do with factories. It's actually because of the stormwater problem. And what happens is uh, in this water cycle, when the water falls, it actually picks up all these pollutants from the, the things that we handle and work with in our everyday life. You can see another part of that is agriculture. Um, agriculture we're not going to focus on too much in this presentation, but there obviously are a lot of issues with agriculture. But we're going to focus on the urban environment and what we can do to improve our stormwater here. So the biggest problem, if you think about it, is these impervious surfaces. So really the impervious surfaces that we need in order to uh, travel, 
to uh, have a home, uh, you know, we basically need these things in our, in our environment to live our everyday lives. The problem is, is that natural cycle is broken. So that water that used to soak into the ground or run through natural channels is now diverted, in most cases, into pipes. And you can see we have all these sheet flows. And uh, so we have uh, not only pollution, but we have quality issues too. And that's where the pollution comes in. So on these hard surfaces, when uh, they come into contact with basically anything you can think of, when rainwater, snow, ice, anything hits that, it has the potential to run off with those impervious surfaces and goes directly into our streams, rivers, lakes, and ponds. So some of those things, a kind of common sense that you might think about, you know, fuels and oils from our cars and all other things. Uh, you know, how often do you see that when you see a rainbow sheen after a rain going directly into the storm drain? Pesticides. You know, we, we live in uh, a world where we really like green grass, and uh, we don't like those dandelions in our lawns. So, you know, those things have the potential to run directly off, too. Fertilizers, same thing. You know, uh, we basically are uh, putting a lot of things on our uh, lawns that maybe we don't even need to. So we'll talk about that. Impact from soil and sediment. This is another one that uh, most people have probably seen in their everyday life. When a big rain event comes, you look at that storm drain out in the road and you see it looks like almost chocolate milk going into the, uh, the catch basin. Pet waste. Is everybody picking up their pet waste? Um, that can have detrimental effects as well, so we'll talk about that. And really what does this mean? You know, look at the bad side. Some recent news you may have heard, these are just events that occurred within the last several months. Um, last year we had probably the largest algal, toxic algal bloom in uh, the Ohio River history. If you look here at the map, it actually stretched all the way from almost the coast or the border of Pennsylvania all the way through Ohio and down to Indiana. And that was a stormwater impact that's basically caused from stormwater pollution. And the big one we've been hearing about now, Flint Water. Um, the big crisis they have up there with uh, contaminants of metals in their water. Again, a lot of that is directly related to stormwater and the stormwater runoff. You know, a lot of people just think about humans, but there's, a, there's a, another factor to this, to the environment and the animals that we live on this earth with, is uh, stormwater pollution kills all the aquatic life. So, it's not uncommon that we see uh, fish kills, which is the photo up here to the upper left-hand side. Um, but the other one that a lot of people forget about, and even in my field, is the, all the other things in there that the fish need to live, and not to mention the birds. You have, um, obviously, the amphibians, the frogs, and all those salamanders and things that live in there. But you also have macroinvertebrates. You have a lot of wildlife that actually do live in those waters. And it does affect us, again, directly on our recreational and our food level. So here in Ohio, you know, we have beaches closed because Lake Erie is uh, too contaminated at times for people to get into it, and it's not safe. Um, the fish we eat, we're limited by how many fish because of the contaminants that the fish might have. And on the positive side, um, this is kind of lost lots of times when people talk about pollution, but there is a, uh, a benefit to it as well. Um, there's been known economic benefits to uh, improving your stormwater runoff by creating new jobs, um, your visitor tourism goes up, uh, obviously businesses do better when they're along a waterfront with cleaner water, um, builders, and uh, they benefit from it. And now the big push is green construction and infrastructure. So communities have gotten on board with these stormwater um, improvements have actually seen a benefit in that as well. And of course, property value. You know, property values go up when you have a, a better uh, living environment. So the first thing I wanted to talk about that's getting really basic, but unfortunately a lot of people still don't know this. Um, it's not uncommon that I'll go out and do a presentation with 60-year-old people that still don't get the concept that our storm sewer system is completely separate from the sanitary sewer. Now, there are a few exceptions, and I'll show you here in the next slide, where the, um, the systems are still combined. That's illegal, and that's usually in uh, larger urban areas, and we're actually in the process of having all those removed. So there are a few exceptions to this, but the main thing to understand is um, 
when you put when you flush your toilet or any wastewater in your home and it goes down the drain, that does go to a um, a plant to where it is treated and then it's released to the environment. Storm sewers, on the other hand, look more like this, where it is a direct conduit and it goes uh, directly to your streams and rivers. So EPA identified this as a problem, and the way they decided to address it is they decided to go after the storm sewer systems and the public infrastructure. So what that means is every storm sewer system in our local communities, whether you know it or not, has a permit. And uh, US EPA and the state EPA actually permit that storm sewer systems in our roads. And I don't want to get into the nuts and bolts of all the requirements of that permit, but I did want to basically kind of give you the timeline uh, going back to this previous slide, in the 90s is when that started, and they started in large communities. And uh, we came into the Cincinnati area, March 10, 2003, the phase two of the stormwater permit is when we came into the, uh, the stormwater world for being um, uh, permitted. All of our communities here in Hamilton County now have a stormwater permit. So if you're a village, if you are a city, if you're a township, your local uh, government actually has a stormwater permit to fulfill the requirements. And here in Hamilton County, the way we tackled that problem is we basically created a stormwater district to where if you decide you want us to um, provide those services to you, we will do that. And you can kind of see the map here of who's included. This map's a little out of date, but it shows you there are a few communities who do their own stormwater, which is perfectly fine. Um, but what we did here in Hamilton County was we offered that service, and the, rather than create a whole new agency, we actually use partner agencies, and that's where Hamilton County Public Health comes in. We are, Kyle and I work for Hamilton County Public Health, but we work on behalf of the stormwater district. So we, we basically are here to provide the stormwater um, district uh, permittees, all those local districts who have those permits, we keep them in compliance. Um, part of that is education like we're doing today. But you can see the other partner agencies are Hamilton County Soil and Water, Hamilton County Engineer's Office, Planning and Development, and we do have a consultant who puts together a report that, at the end of the year. So what I want to do, rather than focus on the permit itself, I think most people would benefit uh, from just kind of understanding what they can do to eliminate these uh, stormwater pollution sources and what they should be looking for. So I'm going to go through, EPA has what they call best management practices, and it's basically ways to minimize stormwater pollution. So we're going to go through seven of those, and uh, I'll provide you examples here in Hamilton County that we've encountered. And then, like I said, about uh, halfway through this, I will turn it over to Kyle, and he'll show you uh, even more interesting recent things we found that fall outside of these best management practices. So number one, um, like I said before, you know, we, always, we tend to forget. We see a drain. We think that that drain is taking that water where it needs to go. And keep in mind, these drains, when they're outside, they are storm drains. So they should be going directly to a stream. So what we had here back in 2014 is um, uh, car dealership that provided free car washes to anybody who purchased a car from their business. Um, so they literally did hundreds, if not even at the end of the year, maybe thousands of car washes. And as part of that process, um, they did a, the primary washing inside the building, which would go to the sanitary sewer, which we discussed. However, they did pre-washing, like washing the wheels, the, uh, the mats, all that stuff outside. All that was going directly into the storm drain and as you can see, was uh, going directly into a stream. You can actually see the suds on the water of where that water hit the stream. And of course, all the vegetation, well, not so much the vegetation, but all the aquatic life in that stream was completely gone. We've since remedied that situation. Now what they do is they actually have a second bay available. You can actually see the bay to the left of the one where they're working. They pull the vehicles in there first, do their pre-washing, and then they pull it over to the wash bay. So, Again, education, they had the opportunity to, to be doing the correct thing. They just didn't realize what they were doing. Here's another business uh, back in 2014. This business actually rents hydraulic equipment, like construction equipment for job sites, 
And what they were doing is that back when people brought their equipment back at the end of the day, they would wash all that equipment down, again, outside, and was going directly into the storm drain, and that was going right into the, um, uh, the storm sewer system and then into the Mill Creek. So that was another rather easy solution. Um, they could just move those uh, operations inside. Uh, this here, this is an even uh, much bigger problem. This is one that you wouldn't necessarily see when you're driving by. This was a large car wash facility that um, you can, if you look at the bottom left-hand corner there where uh, Kyle, that's actually Kyle Dexter who will be doing the second half, there's a, an outfall uh, close to where his legs are. Uh, somebody canoeing in the Mill Creek actually noticed some suds coming out of that, out of that outfall. And we went out, went out and did an investigation and found out this large car wash, this is a large residential, uh, well, it's commercial, but they do um, private car washes for anybody who wants to pull in there. Their wastewater system did go to sanitary, which is what it's supposed to do. But if you look up at the left-hand corner, upper left-hand corner picture, what happened was there was a clog in their sanitary sewer that they weren't aware of. And there was an overflow which allowed that wastewater to go into their storm sewer system. So... All their wastewater generated that facility was going directly into the storm sewer system without anybody's knowledge. The only way we found it was we performed a, a dye test, and that's when we found out that water was going directly into the Mill Creek. So it just goes to show you that uh, the power of observation of somebody who was actually canoeing on the Mill Creek to see that. Here's a warehouse facility where they were washing all their trucks outside Again, not in the proper location, so we corrected that. The other issue they had here, after they washed the vehicles, the photo to the right is where they would pull the truck up, so any residual waters that might still have been in those trucks that had a lot of food debris and things left in it, chemicals, that was also going into the storm drain. So like I said before, what's the solution? The easy solution is these things need to go to sanitary sewer. Most of the time that means having a wash bay inside, which you see in one of our county garages here to the left. Um, to the right, you have an outdoor area, washing area. And what they did there, that's actually plumbed into the sanitary sewer. However, they're keeping the stormwater out with the roof over top. That's a requirement that uh, is needed for sanitary sewer. Um, another, so this is another second best management practice. Where are vehicles and equipment being maintained? So here's the facility back in 2012 where we went up to a salvage yard, we had received a complaint, and you can see they were tearing down all their vehicles and doing any maintenance, um, all their engines, which you see in the bottom left-hand corner, transmissions in the middle photo. Everything was being stored outside and taken apart without proper cover over top. And of course, going into the, you can actually see the storm drain there, going into the storm drain and directly into the storm sewer system and out into the environment, actually going through a park there on the right-hand side. So that was another one where we had a, a good solution where basically they moved everything inside. Uh, service garage in 2014, you can see they were doing all the maintenance on their uh, mowing equipment outside directly above the catch basin. Snow plows with hydraulic uh, fluids and things, all that was leaking outside. Just some more pictures, you see a leak coming from uh, some, uh, a truck there, another snow plow. This, uh, this is actually that same food distribution facility I showed before. Not only were they washing their trucks there, but they were also doing all their maintenance. And you can actually see in the photograph the uh, just very uh, deplorable conditions they had in managing their fluids when they were uh, working in, on the equipment outside. Again, solution, move it inside. Uh, this is Coleraine Township uh, up on the left-hand side there. You know, they have a incredible building that they could do all these things inside. Um, not everybody has that, but there are solutions you can come up with. Other simple things. When you see that leak, do you place a drip paint under it? Um, like I said before, if you see leaking equipment, maybe you have the option to move it inside. That's what's happening there to the right. Uh, good housekeeping and spill prevention. That's a third best management practice. So basically, how are you storing your fluids that could stormwater could come in contact with? You can see here in the photo to the left, you have drums being stored outside. Um, they're not covered. Uh, you can see they're right next to a storm drain. They're not leaking right now, but uh, what happens if somebody backs into them? What happens if that rust on the top uh, falls through? It's going to leak right into that storm drain. 
So the solution in these cases, you want to uh, try and store them inside if you can under cover, and actually you want to put them on secondary containment, which you can actually see those drums on the right-hand side are stored on uh, devices that will actually capture uh, any uh, product that might come off if they do happen to leak. Are you prepared for a spill? So you can see these tanks here. Um, do you see any signage? Is, are staff aware of what to do if there's a spill? So here's an example of where they did put up proper spills and they actually will direct you to where spill kits are located. So if you do have the potential for spill, it's a good idea to have spill kits in place. And the permit that I was talking about before actually requires those spill kits to be located at our county garages, our city garages, our township garages. So it's actually in the permit that you have to have those anyway. But on top of that, have you been checking your spill kits? Do they have all the right things in them? Did somebody take something and not replace it? So those are things that you should be doing. Again, I said it before, good housekeeping, drip pans is essential. Um, other just everyday things we don't think about, when you're doing work, do you put a drop cloth down? Do you have any type of uh, thing to contain that, uh, that product that might come off during your work activities? Facility pollution prevention plans. Have you even thought about these things? Do you have a plan in place? So if there is a spill, um, what is your plan? Uh, do you keep an inventory of what you have? Uh, again, the, the permit requires that municipal buildings do this, but businesses should be doing this as well. Here's an example of a map which shows you where all your drains are, so that way you know where things are going, um, you know what your tools are, you know, you basically know everything about your facility in case there is an incident and you can prevent incidents from occurring. Here's an example of uh, uh, spill reporting and response. If there is a spill, do you know what to do? Like I said before, you definitely don't want to be doing what they're doing on the left there. You do not want to wash any type of spill directly into the storm drain. Uh, what you should be doing is uh, dry cleanup techniques, which the photo to the right here is showing. So uh, basically, a spill occurred, you want to use an absorbent, uh, get it soaked up, and then that becomes solid waste at that point. The other question, though, that I want to make sure people are aware of, if it's a hazardous material, that's something that you might want to have in your, um, either your plan or just be aware that those are, there are things that we don't want to clean up that it would require a hazardous um, uh, specialist to come in and uh, clean up. So this is key. If, I, if you take anything from this presentation today, this is what I want you to take from this. If you do see something, in this case a spill, but if you see any types of these pollution sources we're talking about today, do you know who to call? And that's key because that's where we come in. We're the ones who actually go out and investigate these complaints, and we rely on uh, people such as you to let us know when you see these things. So you've probably seen we have ads out, we have bumper stickers, but our hotline number here in Hamilton County is 946-7000. That's the number to call if you happen to see any type of spill, release, anything potential at all. Even if you don't know, call us. We'll be happy to investigate it for you. So here's some examples. Here's uh, somebody called about this. They, they saw paint on a catch basin. I went out and investigated it. There you go, there's the outfall. Uh, because that resident called us, we were able to take care of the situation. And it turned out it was a uh, painting company who had some leftover paint and did that. So we were able to actually educate that painting company on what they should be doing to uh, get rid of their waste as well. Here's another example, came in on the hotline. Uh, somebody called in, they saw a pumper truck here on the photo to the left. This is a truck that hauls uh, septage from septic systems, and something just didn't seem right to them. I don't know if they actually saw the hoses, but what was happening is they were emptying that truck in that, um, that manhole in their backyard almost every day. And unfortunately, that went directly to the Little, uh, Little Miami River. So you can see the photo to the right. All that was outletting directly into um, one of our you know, most beautiful rivers here in the state of Ohio. So that, that came in from uh, a citizen who happened to call the hotline. Another one, blue-green algae. This was a brand new development. You can see the photo up on the upper hand right there. This is a, uh, a brand new subdivision that went in. They had walking trails around it, a playground next to it. Um, the issue there was the uh, fertilizer. We talked about fertilizer before, over-fertilizing your lawn. All that was getting directly into their storm sewer system there in their um, residential area and going into this pond, and they have too many nutrients. And, of course, nutrients is what sparks the blue-green algae outbreak. So that was another one 
that, that we were very appreciative they reported it. So if it doesn't make sense, if you're not sure, report it to us. Street maintenance. Um, you know, how are these streets being maintained? You know, do you see people uh, throwing litter out? We see that kind of stuff all the time. Keep in mind, all that stuff, if it's not cleaned up, that ends up in our catch basins. Cigarette butts, same thing. These are all major problems we have with stormwater pollution. Here is the Mill Creek. This was just taken last year. Um, you can actually see the amount of uh, debris from this very problem that gets into our, uh, our local watersheds. This is an equilibrium area right between the river and uh, where the Mill Creek meets the Ohio River, and it's actually holding all that garbage in one spot. But just unbelievable amount of litter that gets into that system. So if you see a road or something like that that has a lot of garbage, litter in it, let us know. We have options to, to get people out there to sweep it, to get it clean. Um, there, there's options, but we, we need to know about those things when they happen. Uh, again, with street maintenance, leaf management. Uh, how often do you see this where the photo to the left, you have a leaf pile, which is going to be picked up more than likely by the municipality, the township, whoever, but it's being stored directly up against that, that catch basin. That's not the proper way to do that. Um, you know, there are ways to do that. We have fact sheets available. Um, we work with townships on how to do this. Uh, it actually is detrimental to the integrity of the system as well. So what we ask in those situations, again, call us. We can take care of it. But for us, what we can do is we can work with the either the property owners, with the uh, the maintenance crews, uh, the public works crews, whoever's picking those things up to get the word out, whether it's through flyers, door hangers, how to properly manage your yard waste so it's not impacting stormwater. And, and here's kind of what I'm talking about. These are examples. So, and these are things that you can do as a community. Um, if you're interested, we have activities where the gentleman up there in the uh, upper left-hand corner, he's actually putting a label onto these storm drains saying that this drains directly to a watershed. You've probably seen these. They actually have our hotline number on them to call us. Um, but those are activities that Boy Scout groups can do. We've had um, uh, actual cities call us and request to get those uh, floor I'm sorry, the, uh, the labels to put them on themselves. But those are community activities you can do to improve stormwater. Uh, we have door tags. You can leave door tags. You can go out and uh, have a door tag event where you uh, basically communicate the importance of stormwater. And then, uh, like I said before, the yard waste, that is a fact sheet. We have countless fact sheets here that, at Public Health that address these problems where if you're interested, it could be as simple as do you have those fact sheets in your lobby? and your, um, your offices. So when people come in, you know, they're, they're in a waiting area, maybe they could read up on these, these uh, stormwater issues and learn about them. Uh, this is one that you may have seen and never thought too much about, but this is a major problem. So this was up in uh, one of our townships just last year where uh, a crew was putting in new gas lines. And you can see in order to do that, they had to saw into the road and rather than uh, do proper dry cleanup techniques or capture it in different ways, they were washing it all right into the storm drain. Another example of that, actually a business doing that, and you can actually see the, the stream in this one where it turned a stream, um, basically it became a, a stream of uh, slurry from that concrete. Material storage, again, we kind of talked about this before. But, uh, you know, how are you healing your materials? You can see in the photo there to the right, that was a business here in Hamilton County. That very next rain event, all that's going to end up right into our, uh, our local waters. Again, you know, what are the solutions? What can you do? The photo to the left, they're moving things inside. Not everybody has that ability to do it. So one of the things you can do is cover those materials. It's as simple as putting a tarp on it. Um, some other things you can do is you can actually, they have more expensive things. So you can see the photo to the right there. It's actually a containment that you can pull down and keep stormwater out of that. And that actually works perfect because you also have a secondary containment spill system there on the bottom. The photo to the left is what you don't want to do. You have all those drums stored outside and you can see the storm drain right there uh, adjacent to them. If a spill occurs, you're not going to even have an opportunity to clean that up before it gets directly into our surface waters. Landscaping and lawn care, another best management practice. How often have you seen this, or maybe even been guilty of this, where rather than blow that grass into your yard, 
you blow it out into the road and you leave it there. Um, it's obviously not good for the environment. All that's going to end up directly in the storm sewer. Um, what that does, uh, without getting into the science of it, it basically starves the oxygen out of the water because bacteria start to break down that grass once it gets into the system, and uh, it beco becomes a toxic environment for the uh, wildlife in that water. This simple solution is either, like I said before, you blow it the proper way, or when you're done with the work, you blow all that grass back into the grassy area. Um, your fertilizers and pesticides, it's so critical to follow the directions on it. So many people think if you over-apply, you're going to get double the results. It's just simply not the case. And there's also buffer areas. How, how close are you applying that to actual surface water areas? You've got to watch those things. So again, like I said, you don't need to over-apply. Here's the other key thing a lot of people don't realize. Here in Hamilton County, we actually have pretty good soil for grasses. We don't need necessarily to fertilize. So one of the services a lot of people don't know is available out there, you can actually have uh, Hamilton County Soil and Water come out and evaluate your soil for you, and they will give you um, an actual um, result of your, your soil on your property, how you should be fertilizing it, if at all. So that's a service out there that a lot of people don't take advantage of and, and certainly could be advertised in your community. Again, when you apply those fertilizers, are you making sure that they don't get on the impervious surface? You can see in the photo to the left, he's using a broadcast spreader. It's hitting that paved area. Next rain event, that's going to all end up in the, uh, the local river there. So blow those things back on, um, or you can, uh, the far photo to the right, they're actually brushing all that stuff back in. And the last one I'm going to talk about, uh, landscaping and lawn care, uh, is, you know, when you apply it, make sure that you're not applying it at the wrong time. Are you applying it before a big rain event? Um, if you are, you're basically just letting that money go directly into the river. It's never going to even see the benefits of hitting that uh, vegetation that you want. Same thing with wind. If you're putting it in during high wind, a lot of those materials are never going to even end up where you're targeting. So before I hand over to Kyle, um, I did want to just kind of bring up a couple of sites that uh, back in 2014 that were uh, news to me and maybe news to you, but we have a major problem here in Hamilton County, and I'm guessing probably nationally as well because this is not just local to us, but uh, dumpsters. You know, we all of our waste generally goes to, to dumpsters, and if we're throwing liquids and things in there, or in this case, this is a uh, supermarket where they have a compacting portion to the dumpster, all those liquids have to go somewhere, and most of the time our uh, dumpsters are not leak tight. So in this case, this was a compacting dumpster that was squeezing all, we call it dumpster juice, directly out, went into the storm sewer and right out into this stream in one of our townships. And you can see, the reason I wanted to show this, this is the after photo. So these are the exact same locations. I'll go back. That is the dumpster to the left leaking, and that is the pipe where it came out into the stream. You can see the, the color, discoloration. And this is literally just a few weeks after they fixed the problem. You can see the water's clear and the dumpster's no longer leaking. Here's another example. Um, this was another compacting dumpster. The catch base, I'm sorry, the storm drain is directly underneath of the dumpster. The water it actually was black. And here's the after, same location. So water cleared up and the dumpster was removed. So I'll go back one last time to take a look, and you can see the difference. So I'm going to hand this over to Kyle. Kyle's going to give you examples from just last year, and um, if you have any questions, like I said before, just go ahead and uh, you can ask them there in the chat area, and we'll be happy to answer them for you. Hello there. This is Kyle Dexter. been with uh, Hamlin County for 22 years, and um, I've been in storm water since 05. Uh, doing a lot of stormwater things. Um, Brad's been talking a lot about um, reporting. And I'm going to go back a couple of slides here. This particular uh, dumpster problem, uh, we found actually after we found this one. This is the one that got us looking. This is the one that made us realize that dumpsters are a major problem. And it came in through a complaint. Somebody called us and said their stream looked nasty. And that dumpster is probably 200 yards from the outfall for that stream. And so we started investigating, find out what was going on, and 
that far away from that stream. We found this dumpster which sits in a, um, like a truck dock area with a French drain at the base, uh, literally on an angle. And it was uh, just every time a storm would come, it would wash it right into the stream. So we got this from a complaint. It actually got us on board with dumpsters. It made us realize that these are a major problem in food, uh, actually food uh, preparation, period, can create a lot of stormwater problems. So we've got our guys out there now that inspect restaurants making sure that these dumpsters are being looked at at the same time. And we've got, uh, we've, we've really, really gotten a lot of good response from the uh, companies and things about making sure these things are kept clean and sanitary. So you can see, uh, you can see how bad these can get. Uh, the, this particular complaint came in from one of our uh, public works supervisors, and he uh, called us up and said there was something nasty in the in behind the uh, municipality um, uh, public works garage, going through the creek, which went actually through a uh, through a park. And so we went out and uh, found quite a mess. And obviously, it had been going on for quite some time. Um, and it travels across, you can see where it goes through the storm sewer system and across the street to the, uh, the park there. So again, reporting these things to us gets us on those, uh, on those uh, companies to make sure that they use best management practices to keep these things cleaned up. Uh, salt is a huge problem. I don't know if you heard about some of the problems they've had up north with uh, salt piles and the way they're stored. I mean, we have to use salt for safety and things like that to make sure that our roads are safe during the winter time. But there's also an issue with storage. How is it stored? And um, so we've got public works garages. We've got um, people that actually sell salt, people that actually um, use it for parking lots at malls and things like that. So they have salt that they have to have uh, have to store. And we also found that. Um, a lot of times if you have a mild winter, that the next year uh, they still have to take their salt delivery. So they find themselves with way too much salt and nowhere to put it. You can see that on the left there, they have a dome. They have a nice place to store their, their salt, but they had to take possession of the salt that they ordered from the previous year and they had nowhere to put it. So it's very, very difficult to, to, uh, to uh, store that salt and keep it from becoming a problem. On the left there, this particular, again, there's a very nice dome uh, to store the salt in, but the salt was delivered wet. So we learned here at Public Health and our stormwater group that there's other problems that these guys find themselves with where they cannot control the salt because it was delivered wet. So there's another entity that needs to be approached on how they store their salt. The ones that are selling the salt to the suburbs uh, for their road treatment, we got to make sure that that salt is actually being delivered dry and, and properly. So it's another avenue that we uh, use to approach and try to solve uh, problems. Um, the, as I said, some of these uh, malls, department stores and things like this, they keep it on hand. They keep it at the location. Um, and we found that they, in many cases, they were not covering that. And so it was causing problems. You can see it leaching out behind the, uh, the, uh, the berming there. And when people know, it, 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 as Brad was talking about, when, when people realize what they're doing or not doing, they literally start to pay attention. They don't think about it. They don't realize that uh, stormwater and runoff can cause so many problems in the streams, lakes, and creeks around uh, around these areas. Another one. This is a private contractor that has a huge pile of salt uncovered, I don't, and and it's and there's a catch basin right next to it. But I will tell you, as we go along, as we move through uh, all these different things, we do get uh, people to um, cooperate, and we monitor. And they realize that they, they're, they're learning along with uh, the rest of us that you must be careful. This particular pile is a huge uh, salt, actually became a, quite a uh, 
money-making commodity uh, in, I would say, 2015, where actually it skyrocketed to uh, very, uh, at least probably tripled in cost. And uh, so when that happens, you've got people that want to make money on it. And this particular uh, independent contractor has a large pile of salt sitting on a porous surface, which is very dangerous to the aquifer. And he's, he's, he found that he could make money on it. Well, come to find out, one of our inspectors went out at that site and uh, made sure that we realized that there was a large pile of salt that was sitting out there on a uh, pervious surface over an aquifer. Uh, we talked to the contractor and they cooperated and they covered it. We will continue to monitor this site to make sure that that continues because covering a salt pile, especially as big as that one, is, a, is quite a job, quite a difficult job. And so there could be that employees don't, uh, you know, follow the rules and, and keep it covered or they're not, um, you know, a windstorm comes over and it, and it blows the cover off or something like that. So we will monitor this site and continue to do that. Here's one that caught, it, caught us off guard, uh, and I think it caught the contractor that was installing this geothermal and um, green energy um, uh, installation here of a th uh, geothermal. And what they do is they, they drill down into the ground probably 300 feet, and they're using water, and all this slurry comes up and, 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 uh, and clay and things that comes up to the surface. Normally, they have a pit or something that they dig where they can dispose of that slurry and, um, and make sure that it, it uh, basically settles into the ground, dries up, and then they can cover it up. It actually comes from the ground, so it's not a big deal to put it back, but you do not want it in your streams. This particular site um, was on a, a, a property that had a slope to it that went right to the stream and they lost control of the uh, slurry that was that, that was produced during this process of uh, drilling these uh, geothermal wells. And in the process, it ended up in the stream. Sediment is very, very bad for stream. Uh, animals and uh, aquatic uh, life in that stream would feel like as if we walked, uh, they're like in a smoke-filled room where they can't breathe. That's the same kind of thing that they would feel in this stream with all this sediment and and things. Like I said, we uh, we are learning as we go here. We are learning, as, as, along with the people that are producing some of these pollutants, are learning. Um, there's a lot of microbreweries out there these days. Uh, they're springing up all over the place. If you like beer, that's a good thing. Um, but there's a problem. They did not uh, basically think about the kinds of waste that that process creates. So they have this grain that they use for uh, for uh, fermenting beer and things, and they are uh, they have to get rid of it somehow. And they were putting these trucks, and those trucks leak, and of course then it goes right into the storm sewer. In actuality, when they start to plan these businesses, they need to take that into consideration and make sure that they can send that spent grain um, uh, leachate to the sanitary sewer and not to the streams. They should not be doing that outside. They need a cover uh, over a, a large per, uh, impervious surface with a drain in it so that no stormwater can go to the sanitary, but their waste products can. And we found that this, so again, we find one location where this problem is happening, and we realize that there's many other locations that are doing the same kind uh, doing the same kind of processes, and we found that actually they were having troubles uh, containing that uh, that leachate that's coming out of that grain. This particular facility uh, took this very seriously and became proactive, and they they uh, purchased this uh, containment uh, that they've now put around their truck to catch this uh, leachate that comes from this grain, and they're basically which is very difficult. It slows their process, and it's not an easy thing to do. But they are lit, they are actually pumping it out of that containment into that barrel that you see up on the uh, 
of the dock, they pump it into that barrel, they take it in and they empty it to the sanitary sewer. They also are proactive in putting their berm, the, the little snakes around the uh, drain there, to try to keep that anything that does get loose, uh, have it soaked up and keep it out of the creeks and streams. This is another situation. Uh, schools uh, let out in the summertime, so it's time to do maintenance in the schools. And uh, one of those things is re uh, sealing the floors, polishing the floors, those things, stripping the floors. And it just so happened that this particular janitor was uh, went out into the uh, curbside there and dumped his uh, floor stripper uh, water, and it went right into the storm drain. This had actually in this com to particular community, they have had several incidences where they've had milky uh, colored water in their streams, and they they did not know where this was coming from. Well, this guy actually this time it, normally he would just dump it in the floor drain and the school inside the school, and this. On this particular, and so nobody knew where this, and that drain was actually going to the storm sewer. So no one knew where it was coming from it for a while. Well, he dumped it in the street, and we found out. So now they got to tie that floor drain inside the school into the sanitary sewer, and this problem should be solved as long as all the employees are trained properly and and uh, told about this incident that occurred. So we have the fire department. We have everybody out trying to. Uh, uh, put some booms up in the stream, keep that uh, stripper from going any farther than that, and then they're lifting it from that stream and they're discharging it into the sanitary sewer where it belongs. Keep in mind that if you uh, never put anything in the sanitary sewer unless MSD knows about it, they need to know what's coming down that uh, that pipe so they know how to treat it and uh, you know what kind of uh, substances that are coming down the pipe. So sewer breaks are a major problem. I'm I'm uh we're finding that a lot of this infrastructure, old infrastructure is installed in a creek. So these days they might go near the creek but they never put it in the creek because the erosion issues, the reasons why, you know, common sense really tells you that with the water running down the creek, those sewer lines and uh, infrastructure are going to eventually fail. Uh this particular uh, situation was more of a clog, and it has to do with grease from restaurants. Again, we're back at food as uh, being uh, quite a pollution, uh, uh, quite a lot of pollution is caused by food. So this pipe got clogged with uh, grease, and it failed. It broke the side of the pipe open, and it filled that, and it actually uh, filled that stream, if you see the red line, uh, where the sanitary is up there. It filled that stream with uh, all kinds of sewage and then eventually discharged down uh, down below uh, at, a, at an outfall down there in that creek. So EPA, when they arrive, they basically start to uh, order a cleanup. And again, what they did was uh, put a pump in the creek down there and lifted it to that sanitary sewer. If you see on the left, the lids off that sanitary sewer manhole, they lift it and put it in that sanitary sewer uh, where it belongs. This is another example of it's not a good idea to install your sanitary sewers in the creek line uh, because of erosion and things. This is actually a problem here that, hap that happened. The tree fell over, lifting the, you know, all the roots come up out of the ground, and it pushed that sanitary sewer pipe uh, away from this, the bank of the creek. And so it just opened up and, and um, really did a lot of damage to that creek. Again, as Brad was talking about, reporting these things is very important. Pay attention to your surroundings, the odors and the colors of the creeks and things like that, so that we can get out there and, make, and solve these things as quick as, pro, uh, as possible. After they had to bring their bulldozers in and take out some trees and things there, MSD did, and they put concrete over that line to ensure that it did not um, reoccur. Another one, this is a uh, 
this is actually a, a, a manhole that is overflowed due to a clog, and the uh, history has said that has told us that this particular sewer line has a, has a history of problems. So you see where the manhole was, and the sewage flowed down all the way. And you can see also this is a good illustration of how this how this uh, these sewers are installed in, along the creek beds. Um, but it overflowed, and it, it starts to come down through there, and it hit this little wetland that's down at the uh, bottom of that hill, right there. And so, it, and it's and it, this creek actually drains towards Whitten Woods Creek or Whitten Woods Lake, I should say. Sorry. And so, this is a picture of that of that uh, that wetland. This is a picture of MSD after they realized that this is a, a problem area. This, this is actually a, a location where they get a lot of clogs. They actually started to um, work their way up that stream. Go back to this one. Work their way up that stream and to repair that sewer. So they had bulldozers out and uh, four-wheel drive trucks and they were making their way up through the woods there to start repairing that line, whether they're going to put a, a liner in it uh, or just replace the pipe altogether. They did a full inspection of that line to make sure that they uh, stopped this from occurring. This is a uh, diesel fuel leak. I wasn't actually on site for this one, but Ed was on site for this. Um, a truck made a, a too short of a turn there. You see the arrow pointing at the uh, diesel fuel tank of that truck, and it tore the whole side out of that truck, uh, out of that diesel tank, and spilled all over the place. So there was a, and there's the, uh, it actually, that's the culprit there, um, where they actually ran into that that fire hydrant with that with that uh, diesel fuel tank. Got your blue green algae. This is a major problem, uh, and it has to do with uh, non point source pollution basically, uh, runoff from all the uh, farm fields. Um, I'm sure dumpsters and all those things have some effect on this, but all those different nutrients, phosphorus, and all these things that are, are basically food for uh, blue green algae uh, washing into the, into the streams and the lakes and causing this problem. This is really unheard of on a, on a moving uh, river. So there's a lot, of, a lot of nutrients being washed off the uh, surface of the ground and uh, going into those streams and creating a, a food source for this algae. Uh, the way we responded to this, not much you can do about it when it starts to grow and bloom, is we went to the areas where uh, there's access to the river whether it's a boat dock or a fishing area or a park or whatever it might have been, any access to that river, the Ohio River, we went down and tried to put some kind of warning signs up to let folks know that utilize that area, that don't let your dogs uh, get into the uh, blue-green algae or drink out of the river and uh, watch, watch it when you're you know, fishing um, and boating and all those kind of things. It's very toxic uh, stuff. Again, we learn as we go about some of the problems. Uh, who, uh, we really never thought about uh, doggy daycares and things like that, that there would be a pollution source um, there. But as we continue to learn and, and uh, discover all kinds of different potential impacts, um, we go from one to the next and realize that um, this could be going on at many other locations. This particular situation here, um, this is, if you see there on the left, there's a wellhead. So that, the water that they're using for this swimming pool for dogs is coming from a well. And what they were doing was, in order to treat the water, rather, rather than use chemicals to treat the water and, and sanitize the water, they were uh, basically, um, diluting the water by continually uh, having well water flow into that pool from that wellhead. 
and then you can see um, in the back there, in the center, the overflow. So as the water was entering that pool, it was also just just as much flow through that overflow and out into the storm sewer and across the street to a park across the street and it caused them a lot of flooding problems out there over there. So it wasn't it was quantity as well as quality that we had a problem with here. And uh, basically they uh, agreed after uh, a long discussion that they would um, no longer do that uh, do it that way. They would treat it as a swimming pool and uh, sanitize it in the same manner. Uh, it, during rain events, and they, they find themselves with too much water in those uh, pools, they are also using an irrigation uh, around, around the property. So that's how they disperse it. And uh, again, like I said, we, we really didn't realize a lot of these problems that were out there. And it takes people reporting these things and let it, letting us know, and then we start to branch out and see if we have got any problems elsewhere. Illegal dumping is quite a problem. I, I, I would imagine back when I was a young person, it was much more of a problem. Uh, people dumping their motor oil and that kind of thing into the storm drains, uh, not thinking about where they go and uh, that they discharge to streams and lakes and things like that. Um, this was an area where they were actually taking cooking grease and dumping it into the storm sewer. Um, and then it, obviously somebody was also doing um, dumping paint. But what got my attention was the cooking grease that was being uh, dumped in this catch basin. One of the things we do in these situations is we actually go out to these areas when we have these problems and we'll place those, um, those uh, labels on these drains that says do not dump uh, waste into the drains we'll actually go out into a neighborhood and start putting those, if they're not already there, putting those on these catch basins to let people, you know, get somebody's attention and, and, uh, and realize where this thing goes. We also drop uh, door tags on the houses to let them know that we, we put the drain labels on there and to let uh, people know to call us if they see someone doing that. Here is a situation in a restaurant, again, grease being dumped into the catch basin. Um, these folks actually had a really elaborate uh, process for getting rid of their grease, disposing of their grease. Well, it stopped working. So you've got the employees, they gotta keep working, they gotta keep functioning. So they almost will do anything to get rid of the grease. And uh, so that they can keep functioning, they have to get rid of it. So they were rolling it out here and dumping it in the storm drain, and we got a call from somebody that was at the drive-through of this establishment, letting us know that somebody was dumping the, the, the grease into the uh, into the system. And luckily, these days, uh, when they cast these storm sewers, they actually put dump no waste uh, drains to the river on those on those uh, catch basin hoods. Um, but obviously, they didn't see this one and they just went ahead and dumped it because they had no other choice. We've actually uh, instructed that, that uh, facility to get them an overflow bin. So if they find themselves in that situation again, they have a bin, a grease bin that they can dump into and, and, get, and keep their processes going. Um, this is quite a problem, grease being dumped from these food service uh, facilities. And uh, like everything else, eventually we will get a handle on it. We do a lot of education. That's our first approach on these things. Just let people know what they're doing and maybe they didn't realize it, don't think about it. Um, so education is a big, is our first approach in these situations. Uh, by the way, uh, we won an award, our program here at Hamlin County, our stormwater program, won an award for uh, uh, excellence. And so I thought we should let you all know that we're doing as, as, as much as we can to uh, stop stormwater pollution. Brad, did you have anything else to add? No, the only thing I'll add to that is that the reason we won that award is really because of what we're doing today is uh, communities, you know, such as yourself or individuals, getting the word out. And uh, these, these rare things that we're starting to see that Kyle just went through, 
has actually resulted from people like you calling us and letting us know. So keep be vigilant. You know, keep your eyes out. Uh, whenever we do these education, I always have people walk away just so surprised at things they never thought about. Um, you know that they are uh, could be a harm to to you and the environment and to our community. So we appreciate you uh, sitting through this. Um, Hopefully you got something out of it. Never hesitate to reach out. Uh, like Kyle said, we have several fact sheets. We have fact sheets for dumpsters. So if you're a community who wants to be proactive and, and have those available in your lobby or even maybe actively go out to facilities when you're out there, provide them. They're out there. I mean, we're doing other things where our food inspectors are doing some of those things, but we're open to anything to improve the education and awareness of these problems. So that's my part to it. Um, if you have any questions, here's our contact information. And um, Kyle, I guess that's really it. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for attending. Uh, share this whenever you can, please. And I don't see any questions, so I, I'm going to take that one of two ways. I, I'm going to take it that we're so good that uh, we basically answered every question that could have possibly been asked. Right, Kyle? Right. Okay. Thanks, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.